our company has really enjoyed the opportunity to do work here, whether it's treating the ash trees uh, or, or addressing hazards with Chris Rupper. Uh, and also, 10 years ago, I, my family and I, we lived in Harrisburg, Tuscany Township, and so we spent a lot of time up here when our children were, were quite young and uh, walking in the trails and the boardwalk, and, and my kids just we so enjoyed the, uh, the uh, nature center upstairs and the, the uh, education I there. So uh, it's really great to be able to come and get back, so thanks. Uh, so our topic, when do they need cut down? And I think you're right. I was uh, wondering about the, the language that makes sense. It sounds like a PA kind of thing. So I, I understood it. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what, where we get. It's a, it's a huge topic. Um, but when I thought about it, and when I drive around the streets, when do they need cut down? Well, then they, they need cut down all the time because here's a street that everyone decided they're going to cut them down, and no one really made much of an effort to put them back. Yeah, there's some trees out of the horizon, but so. Why do they get cut down? And so as a commercial arborist, we, we see a lot of people um, and work with a lot of uh, customers that ask us to cut their trees down. And, and there's a no number of reasons. Trees are messy, so we know that. Um, whether it's the pollen from white pines, um, and some years the pollen on the white pine is just outrageous. You get called after those experience, like, wow, I've never experienced this before and I can't stand it. Um, or the, the, the flower is not very showy of an oak tree, uh, can clog gutters, get on the roof, and you know, get on the sidewalks. Uh, and even the showy flowers, say a uh, saucer magnolia in the lower right there, uh, very early blossom, and often, in the last few years, definitely uh, impacted by a, a late frost, which, you know, everyone gets so excited about the magnolias, and all of a sudden, the next day, they're sort of drooping, and then they're falling off, and then people are slipping on them and um, having to sweep them up. So, uh, they're messy, the flowers are messy. The, um, and then we have situations where we have early leaf drop. So the leaves just come on and then all, all of a sudden there's some pathogens, as in uh, sycamore and those so are uh, twigs of a sycamore tree, American sycamore, and, and may, many of you may know the leaves drop. Uh, they do flush back out again, but it's a big mess. Uh, apple trees and uh, we have apple scab and uh, cedar apple rust and those fungal leaf diseases can impact a number of different species and so People are like, I can't stand it anymore, I'm gonna cut it down, and it's cut down. Um, uh, persistent fruit, right, acorns, mast crop, every few years, the oaks are dumping uh, thousands and millions of acorns on us, and they're just a real pain to clean up. Uh, they don't go away, uh, uh, white um, cones, uh, this one, of course, who knows what that one is? Yeah, Michelle's sweet, sweet gum, that's right. Very persistent. They last for years, and, and they will just create a mulch under the trees. And if um, it's an area where people are walking, they're very they're like marbles. Uh, if it's on a side slope, and you can really roll an ankle pretty quickly. Samaras uh, in the spring, and the silver maple, uh, cl calling, uh, clogging the gutter. You know, they really do an effective job of dispersal. Honey locusts. A lot of those uh, we talked about. They, uh, all of the honey locusts at one point in the eighties was like, oh, they're uh, they're a seedless variety. And then people grew them for like 20 years, all of a sudden, wait a minute, and they have seeds more than, more than even ones that maybe they did in the past. Uh, very persistent fruit um, and need to get cleaned up, and sometimes people don't want to deal with that. Fleshy fruits, who knows what this one is? It's not a native. It looks it's like a native it's fruit. A dog it's a dogwood. Yep, Kusa or Korean dogwood. Um, very showy uh, fruit later in the season. I got a call uh, for an opinion. Uh, a daycare had an inspection. They inspect the inside and the outside of the buildings. And um, the, the note said, ginkgo along the sidewalk, messy fruit, could be toxic to children. And so I got a call, hey, now you need to look at this. And beautiful kusa dogwood. And I said, well, I said, well, it's a kusa dogwood. Yes, um, messy. You know, people could trump them inside, but they are not toxic. And evidently, they're, they're edible. Has anybody ever tried it? There's a short window when they're going to taste good, but it's a little bit like a papaya, uh, peachy, but um, not the best. Um, <laughs> so I think the, al the alternative is, you know, uh, have, it, have it be a teaching tool. It was a daycare, but you know, kids can work and uh, learn about something that's in their environment. You know, between their car and the building that they spent all day in, they can at least enjoy the tree on their way in and out. Um, black cherry, you know, they can stay in cars and sidewalks. And this one here, you can't tell maybe from that picture, but uh, ginkgo, the female ginkgo, right? Very, very nasty. And I would probably agree with that one. Uh, it, the odor is, um, it's like, um, 
as bad as you can imagine, right? Um, <laughs> and persistent. Um, and then fall in general, often in fall, um, and it's often the people that have been on a property for years and years and years and just love the tree, maybe they planted it, but at some point, just it gets to be too much. And uh, so we, they need cut down when they can't stand to pick up the leaves anymore, right? And then there are leaves, the, the marcescent leaves. So it's one thing when you have to pick up leaves in the fall, it's sort of a process, it's a, a little passage. But it's those ones, it's the American beech, some of the oaks will persist through winter. Uh, we call it marcescence. It's a, um, most of our deciduous trees have an abscission layer, and in the fall, that severs, and then the leaves uh, fall off. Well, in, in some of these species, uh, they didn't adapt that way, and so the leaves remain until the spring flush out of new leaves, at which time they come off, and people find that to be a burden. So um, they're messy, right? So trees attract critters, bees, birds, and bugs, and us here, we're like, great, that's, that's what we want, right? Um, uh, squirrels, I guess we always get calls about squirrels. So these are people that they're like, don't touch that nest, that's my squirrel. Or it's like, hey, when you're up there, I won't say anything if you evict the squirrels. <laughs> and the squirrels uh, obviously nest in trees, they feed on, oak, on acorns, they disperse acorns, they dig in the gardens, they dig in the beds. Um, and they're also very effective pruners. Here they're pruning the spruce, uh, tw spruce twigs, dropping white pine uh, sheaths off. And uh, you will see it in all sorts of species. Pinnows, sometimes I'll get called out and there'll be a, a, just a, a, ma a massive litter of leaves on the, on the yard and you can't imagine what's wrong with their tree, that, that somehow the tree is just dropping these branches. And you're not gonna believe this, but a squirrel did that. And um, it's, it's just impressive. And they, um, different studies or uh, uh, resources will say why. Uh, some of them have to do with uh, cutting their teeth. Sometimes it could be just the season and they're hungry and they're getting something from that. Of course, bees, you know, people are allergic to bees. And when I, when I say these things, I never want to say that some of these reasons aren't valid, but they are reasons, right? And so something to look at. Japanese beetles on, on a, a rosacea species uh, can be a nuisance, and sometimes it's better just to, to cut our losses and to uh, continue to deal with the, the damage that results. Aphids on a hackberry uh, resulting in the sooty mold, uh, so the aphids excrete a, a, a sugary excrement that then colonizes a black mold and it's sticky, it gets over everything below it, often on the street tree, it's your car, it's your driveway. And so let's just get rid of it instead of dealing with the problem. Maybe it's releasing uh, lady beetles. And of course these guys, right? Uh, I don't want them in my yard anymore. Red maple, get it out. Uh, silver maple, I don't want it. Um, Atlantis, like the one that those guys are on. Uh, maybe we can make an argument for getting rid of the Atlantis. But um, another reason this tree needs to cut down and then ants, right? So carpenter ants, always a concern. Often find them in Norway maples, uh, and there's a concern that the ants are killing my tree. Uh, we know that uh, ants, they tend to reside in trees and they take, take up residence in uh, a cavity, uh, but they're not actively feeding on live wood, live sapwood or heartwood. Um, and so, but it can be worrisome, especially if they're living in the house. Um, and so, uh, always worth the conversation. There's a lot of ecological relationships uh, between ants and trees. Anybody familiar with catalpas? Um, the catalpa has a, what they call an extrapolar, extrafoliar nectary, uh, and it, all it does is it attracts ants so that they farm this sugar, this nectar, that is produced for no other reason except to bring the ants, so that when other uh, insects that would come to uh, eat the leaves would show up, the ants would kick them off. This is our territory. So uh, uh, that's sort of a, a, a relationship there that, that has evolved over a long time. I wanted to say, um, if anybody has any questions as we're going through this, uh, uh, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll deal with it as we address it, because oftentimes I know I'm that way. Yes, Carol's got a question in the back. When, uh, the squirrels eat the, uh, the ants of the new or new branches, does it damage the tree? No. Um, I could see there could be a situation on a stressed tree when that tree is a mature tree, it needs everything it has, but oftentimes it's, it's reducing some end weight. Uh, that, and what we've learned in pruning anymore is 
because that's where we want to do a lot of our pruning. We don't want to thin the interior as much as we have. And so to, to take some of that and weight out is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. And am I loud enough? Can everybody hear me okay? okay. Birds, right? Pileated woodpeckers will uh, nest in cavities. They'll also uh, uh, peck into to excavate larvae from different uh, wood-boring insects or, or carpenters, right? Uh, Yellow-bellied sapsuckers will create those horizontal holes across a number of different species, from blue, blue atlas cedars to sugar maple. Uh, and unfortunately, they do come back to the same tree year after year, they're migratory, uh, and uh, that over time can be damaging to the tree, but uh, there's really not a lot of effective controls for, for dealing with that. And then of course there's roosting. Uh, where I live in Mount Gretna, there's a, an active there's a population of black vultures that love to um, roost up in Mount Gretna. And in uh, New Year's Eve, they drop a, a big black vulture. <laughs> Starlings and blackbirds. Harrisburg has a real problem um, in the winter, do a lot of work down at the Capitol Complex, and you've probably heard the, the screeching of the recordings they have to try to deter those birds from roosting up, but the, uh, you can imagine the excrement produced from that many birds, uh, it really becomes sort of a public health issue. Um, and sometimes it's, the, the answer is maybe we just gotta get rid of that tree. Yeah. What's the deterrence, that, that screeching? Yes. Oh, I want, all right, I'm here for like, Seven years now, I have no idea what that was. You're like, I'm not crossing the street right now. Why yes, <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and there's different types of calls. And, um, yeah, not very effective. I think they get used to it pretty quick. <laughs> Trees are in the way, right? That's another reason why then you cut down. Here at the Biltmore State, you don't want a tree you know, covering someone's mansion. You know, people think they have mansions around here. And like, that tree is obscuring my really expensive beautiful home. There's my daughter in uh, Adirondacks. You know, trees obscure views. And so even here, they did some vista clearing. It's nice to have some, some trees to uh, sort of frame the view. But, uh, and they can also obscure uh, signs and obscure, obscure uh, driveways. And so there are legitimate reasons why the things don't coexist. One that frustrated me on my way here, though, uh, in 83, I don't know if you've noticed that driving north and you're parallel to Paxton will be on your right, you know where the Nido Burrito is. Well, they just took down a whole bank of trees. And I realized why. Today, I noticed there's a massive billboard. Just what, I, just what we need there. You know, Paxton Creek is at the bottom of that bank, and it seems outrageous that somebody got permission to um, and to left all the debris <laughs> and left the debris yeah, yeah. well maybe that's that's not the worst of it right but <laughs> it certainly is nice to it trees are shady i work our company does do lawn care and we, it's a constant um tension in the trees versus the lawn um the trees shading my lawn i uh, can't get good grass to grow well as an arborist um i always um, side with the tree, and uh, there's always alternatives, but it's never good for, you know, people would say, well, what if I bring in three inches of soil, and I'm going to, you know, reseed it, or I'm going to put sod in, it's just not a sustainable um, possibility, and you're probably going to do damage to that root zone, the roots are where they need to be in the soil profile for a reason, when you put three inches of soil, it doesn't seem like a lot, it can be damaging, and the results aren't going to be there anyway. Um, you, people want to thin their tree, they want to raise their tree and probably raising lower branches to get that incidental light is going to be the thing that helps the most um, but it's always uh, i say let's just put some wood chips around the base and be done with it <laughs> trees damage infrastructure again not something you want to take lightly uh, obviously you know, a lot of sidewalks down in um, harrisburg looking like this big you know they planted these huge well not they weren't huge then but they're huge now pin oaks in a, in a pretty relatively narrow tree lawn, and uh, they lift the sidewalk. This becomes just a, a um, problem because uh, the, cust the homeowner gets a, they get the, they mark the sidewalk, hey, you gotta repair your sidewalk. The sidewalk contractor comes in and decides they gotta cut the root, cut the whole buttress off, and they put the sidewalk in. The sidewalk is great, but either the tree's gonna die within years, or it's gonna fall over. Um, you know, a picture of that later, it's just amazing People can understand, and I think they do, uh, people that live in the neighborhood anyway, um, recognize 
what that root mass looks like. It's not, you know, sometimes there's a feeling that the tree roots go down as deep as the tree goes high or something, and that seems like it would be really stable, but that's not the case. Roots tend to reside in the top 12 inches of soil and they go up. Um, so that makes a problem when you have uh, competing issues that way. Damaged driveways, and here we have a sewer line. So thinking about, obviously the sewer line is there because it has to be, to tie into the street. Um, but maybe when we plant the next tree, we're not going to put it right there. So just a little bit of planning can go a long way so that you don't have to take down a tree prematurely because uh, that wasn't thought about early on. Trees are expensive, we all know that, right? So for, they're expensive to plant, uh, but just to purchase it, to get some to put it in, to maintain it. Uh, you might need treatments over here. Here we are treating a an ash tree uh, with a systemic insecticide to suppress the emerald ash borer. A very effective treatment, but it costs money. You pay you know, every two or three years, uh, just like the park here does. Uh, pruning, sometimes, um, here's the uh, Velcos in Hummelstown. We, we keep those restrained so that for the clearance for the lights and also just to um, maintain them in the, the growing space. And eventually, sometimes we have to remove them, and that's all the cost money, so they can be expensive. <laughs> Trees are hazardous, right? I get that a lot. Um, they can be, right? But not, not usually. Um, it's amazing, you know, you think about um, <laughs> How often we experience um, trees falling down? You know, of course, storms can, can do that. And just walk in the woods, and you can be surprised at what, how long, how a tree can stay up, uh, even with the big, big cavities and different things. So we're going to look at that. That's what I want to focus uh, the rest of our time on. Uh, but we want to weigh that hazard. We're going to talk about the term, but with the benefits. So uh, just let's just um, just call out, what are some of the benefits of trees? Provide shade. They provide shade, yes. Cooling, right? And clean the air. Clean the air, right? They take in carbon, they sequester carbon, they filter oxygen, yes. The aesthetic. The aesthetic, yes, they make us feel good, they look great, yes. They host insects. They host insects, they are uh, in the ecolo ecological um, domain, yes. Any other? Lower the temperature. Yep, yep, cooling. Um, and that could be on a micro scale and also on a, you know, in a, when you think of a whole forest or ecosystem mm -hmm. on a larger scale. Um, yeah, so just from Nature Conservancy, and we could have days of talking on the benefits of trees, but uh, filtering the air uh, up to a third of fine particulate pollutants <coughs> within 300 yards of a tree, cooling the city, we talked about it. Uh, reducing rates of cardiac disease, strokes, and asthma due to improved air quality, protecting biodiversity, uh, gets us out there and being physical by walk, feeling like walking and cycling more often, uh, manages stormwater by sort of uh, slowing all that coming down and, and taking it back up. And they increase our property value more, more often than not, uh, and re they reduce stress. I know that works for me. Provide lumber economically. Yes, and that's what Nate's going to talk about. Uh, after I'm done. And for me, and I think, I don't see any babies in here, um, but these are the trees we have, the mature trees we have, the big trees we have, are the only big trees we're gonna get. Right, so this is an American elm, uh, sort of a little abstract shot in Lebanon, and this is the only mature American elm that any of us will have in Lebanon um, City, and so, that means something, right? And that's important because once it's gone, then it's gone. And so I think it really, uh, we need to weigh that when um, it can be easy to say, well, let's just cut it down. It's, it's messy. It's, um, we have to treat it for Dutch elm disease every three years. That's expensive. Um, but really, uh, it, it can come down to that. And the park knows that too. So this is a sign right here in uh, Wildwood. Uh, we've been treating several mature ash trees uh, for uh, about 10 years now, uh, with great results. Um, one of them's right, I forget where I'm at, right over here, and then there's one over by the, 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 uh, um, the path out from the parking lot before the, the structure. Beautiful big trees, and they're the only one that we're gonna get. And really, the only trees, the only ash, mature ash that are left in our area um, that look that good are, that, that have, they've been treated. Uh, and so, and, and what we've been finding is that uh, because when all of the ash trees were 
uh, live and well, the, the population of that emerald ash borer just took off and then they, they killed all the trees. And so that population is now crashed and it could be that it's going to reside at a very low level. And so uh, we could probably dial back some of those treatments uh, and, and, and um, maybe at some point we'll start seeing some resistance uh, in some of the, the remaining ash. And so there's some hope there where uh, there hadn't been any for a long time. Uh, but, but trees, <laughs> you know, anymore. So, uh, I don't know if anybody used PowerPoint. Like, I would have had to spend, you know, 20 minutes creating that. Now you have this, like, designer, you just click on the right. And, and all I said was, trees are hazardous, and all of a sudden they put a timer on it, right? <laughs> Love that. Uh, so, we talk about hazard. Now we talk more about risk. So, trees can carry risk. Um, what do we have here? Um, so risk, a situation involving exposure to danger. And we put ourselves, we managed that, you know, we all got here and took on some risk. It you know, seemed like a lot of traffic um, getting here tonight, but uh, that seems a lot more risky than you know, sometimes when we think about our trees. So um, it's all about understanding risk and, uh, and weighing, um, you know, weighing, how much we want to take on for what we're getting in return. So not, I say, not all trees have risk. Here's a tree out in the, in the, the wild ones of somewhere. It's a dead tree, and so a dead tree would be a hazard tree. Well, if it were to fall, nobody would even know it. Nobody would even hear it, as the saying goes. Um, and so that tree carries no risk. It's just out there. Now some, some poor fool might decide to sleep under it one day, and it when it comes down, and that's, he was right, he was due. Uh, <laughs> so we take risk and we, and we weigh the benefits with the risk. And often the benefits outweigh the risk, the aesthetic qualities, the, the filtering of the air, the storm water. Um, and so we do that every day. Um, so what we do as professional arborists is we, we are risk managers essentially, and we work with uh, property owners, owners of trees, uh, to help them understand what risks they are assuming and help them either mitigate that risk or help them make the decision to uh, what they'll do with the tree in the future. So there's just a real quick, um, ISA, the International Society of Arboriculture, Culture, is uh, uh, sort of the leading organization uh, that trains arborists and uh, credentials arborists in our field. And so certified arborist is, is sort of the baseline. You have a um, minimum of three years of full-time experience in commercial arboriculture, or you could have a degree in two years. Uh, board certified master arborist, it's uh, several more years, a little more experience, more education. Um, and um, so when you're working with somebody, it's important to find out uh, that they have the, if you're gonna ask somebody about is my tree, what is the risk level of my tree? It should be at least a certified of offer. Um, there's also, in the last 10 years, they have, ISA has come up with a qualification uh, for tree risk assessment. And so it's a couple day program. At the end, you take a test. You have a, a field component where you go out and do this uh, level two risk assessment on a, on a tree. And uh, every five years, you have to go back for a recertification. And it's a really great program. And so um, another uh, uh, important designation and finally, ASCA, the American Society of Consulting Arborists, uh, has a designation called the Registered Consulting Arborist. It's really more of a thing out west. Um, they tend to get into lit litigious matters, uh, whether it be uh, forensics. You know, when that tree does fall in someone's house, whose fault is the, the RCA comes in and will write. It's a lot of report writing and things like that. But in, in our area, um, it's really the, the ISA certified arborist that um, you, you come encounter with. Just another note, uh, sometimes you'll see on uh, companies' websites that do tree care, uh, a member ISA. Membership doesn't, you can be a member, but you don't have to be a certified arborist. Uh, and so it could be a distinction that's worth uh, checking into. So what they've come up with, in the past it used to be a numeric system to rate the risk inherent in trees. Um, and now it's more qualitative instead of quantitative. And so we look at the likelihood matrix. I'm not going to, this will go quick, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> the likelihood, the likelihood of failure. So from improbable, like I'm looking at a tree and I'm like, this is 
very improbable that it's going to fall in the next year. It's always one year. Uh, or it's possible, it could, if something, you know, if this happened or that, it's probable, that's, that's getting a little more concerning, it's imminent, it's almost actively feeling something, you know, when the wind blows, they see something separated. Uh, and then, well, what's the likelihood of impact? Is it in the middle of the field? And in that case, it would be very low. If it's, it, it could go one way, maybe it's going to hit something. If it goes three other ways, not so much. And, and, on, and on and on, so medium to high level likelihood of impacting, and impacting a target that is, so something of value or something of, uh, of uh, us, people. Uh, and so you have, so say we have, a, it's probable, uh, and it's, it's a medium impact, so all of a sudden it's somewhat likely um, uh, is our likelihood matrix, so we take our, that to somewhat likely, and then the consequence of failure. So, um, negligible would fall in someone's yard, not a big deal. So it's, it, that becomes low. And as you go up, you get to um, significant and severe. So uh, those are the sort of ways now that we look at it. And uh, it's not up to us, the arbors, to make the decision on what to do. It's to, to provide the education, inform the, the homeowner, the, the property owner, the tree owner, um, where, that, where that is. And then it's up to them to decide. I'm not really comfortable accepting that level of risk. Uh, there's, a, there's a group of daycare kids that walk by the street three times a day. That's not good enough. You know, if you're telling me that it's uh, uh, medium or you know, somewhat likely, that's, that's not good. Um, so that's sort of just it in a nutshell. Again, this is a couple day kind of class, this kind of thing. So, any questions so far? Yes, Carol. Um, if if your um, tree has been determined that it probably is dangerous and you choose not to do anything about it and it falls, are you then more liable? Very good question, yes. The answer, the short answer would be yes. Uh, oftentimes we'll get called out, it's the neighbor. Hey, my neighbor has this dead tree but he refuses to cut it down and I'm concerned for my, I mean, my grandkids are out here, my car is parked out here, uh, and so we'll get called, do a risk assessment on my neighbor's tree from their driveway or whatever, and, um, and then that person hands that risk assessment, that report to the neighbor and say, hey, you are now on notice. I had a professional arborist come out, evaluate the tree, they said it's an elevated risk for failure, and now something happened, you've, you've been told. And you can imagine where that goes, so very <laughs> messy, can't stand it, um, but it happened. Um, so what, you know, and so I just want to spend maybe 15 minutes running through some of these uh, scenarios that elevate risk of failure in trees. Uh, so when, when they are big and dead and likely to cause damage, death or injury, when they fail soon. Um, so here is, a, obviously this is in summer, the other trees have leaves on them. Here's a tree, side yard, no leaves. Um, you can see this home evidently is, is relatively new. I just pulled this off the internet. Uh, new driveway, so you can imagine there's a lot of damage. The tree's dead. If a, if a tree's dead and has a target, that, that would be a high risk of, uh, of failure, and you know, I would recommend, would recommend that it come down. There's nothing short of uh, other than doing that. So, uh, so how do we know, right? So now it's winter, so uh, deciduous trees are good, because in the summer, well, if it doesn't have leaves on, it's likely it's dead. Uh, but in the winter, how do we know then? One of the things is, is, well, you look back and you think about the summer, and if it had leaves on it, well, it was at least live in the summer, so it's going to take a couple of years before, if the tree did die since summer, um, that it's going to start dropping limbs or falling over. So you have some time, and maybe you just wait till spring to determine the condition. Uh, but other things you could keep in mind uh, are, uh, you know, say you were going to go up to um, a friend who lives in Williamsport, and uh, you see his tree, and you're like, that doesn't look good. Uh, maybe it's dead. So what would you look for? You'd look to see that this tree clearly is dead. But um, it could be degrees of that. And it could be that, so this tree, this, you know, on the right, we see a lot of fine twigs. And, and if we look closer, we probably even see buds that are, that are prepared to uh, push out new twigs and leaves in the spring. And so if, if it has the fine uh, twigs and buds, good chance it's alive. If you, if you break a twig, it might even be green. Um, but if it's not, if, it, if, it's, if it doesn't have that, if it's coarse, and if the bark's falling off, it's a good chance it's dead. 
What about that? That tree's just lost all its dignity, uh, but it's probably <laughs> still alive. Uh, no fine twigs. Um, and people do that for a reason. You know, we'll go out. I just want to, you know, to do this. So, um, obviously, not not a uh, preferred uh, method of, of moral culture these days. There's a lot of reasons why we don't do that. I, you know, we could spend the whole night on that sometime. Question. Uh, yes. If someone did this to their tree uh, a year ago and it recently started having fungi growing on those limbs, we call them, is that tree dying or dead? Yeah, so there's a lot of reason, and it, and it depends on what kind of fungus. So these fruiting bodies, uh, and it could, who knows what the condition of the tree was okay. before that, but it yes. It was healthy. It, it looked good. It had looked good, and now it doesn't, and it's got yeah. saffron. Yeah. So um, it, it's definitely, you can imagine how taking all of the energy producing parts of the tree off of the tree, uh, how that's going to probably have um, negative consequences. So sure. power um, companies will do that to part of a tree. I like my electricity. Yeah. So I never argue with the uh, utility arborist because it, that again is a conflict. Uh, and you know, again, you know, maybe you know, poor planning in developing our utility system and so, uh, but it is true, yeah, um, and it happens. Yeah. Yep. Well, along that same line, the electric company comes out, and they trim half of the tree like yeah. that. Right. Yeah. As far as risk assessment, does that create more weight on one side? It the could, other? And, and in a number of different ways. So again, this isn't um, so easy to parse out, uh, but uh, new wind exposures could cause that other section to fail. It certainly could tip the balance, you know, if we have a, the tree's leaning already. Um, and lots of different reasons, and, and of course, what grows back is never um, as strong as what had grown the first <laughs> so here's several years after. And, and in Europe um, and other areas of the world, uh, this polarding is, is a common and, and it goes back hundreds of years, and it's been an effective strategy to manage trees in relatively small areas, uh, and also the utility, like Dave may talk about it, uh, for collecting firewood for, for kitchen furnaces and, and things like that. Um, but what we tend to do around here, sort of a PA Dutch motto, is every 10 years we're going to do it. And so what grows back is massive and can become hazardous because that it's an epicormic growth. It's a, a sucker, as some people say. And it's growing just on the very end, just on the edge of live, live tissue there, as opposed to being integrated fully as regular branches are connected to larger branches. The only time I've seen it where it looks good after it was on a weeping willow, and when that came back, it came back fuller. Mm, yeah, I hate to see uh, trees that have been topped or heavily reduced when they look good afterwards, because uh, we don't agree with them. And someone's like, well, did you see that tree down at the bank? There's a tree that was Alcoba and Hershey, uh, it's across, uh, 322 across from Lake Karn, and it's at a bank on the corner, and they just really cut the thing back. And it has grown back so nice. It is just like the perfect, prettiest tree. And, um, and it's healthy and it's fine. And, um, you know, some trees are going to tolerate that. And we trim our covers like that in Hummelstown. It, it happens. Uh, but there's got to be a reason. You have to have a, a goal and an understanding for it. What about this? So obviously, Austrian pines, we don't have as many of these anymore because of fungal uh, life diseases. But live on the left and dead on the right, right? Pretty obvious. Uh, but what about these? Are these dead trees? <laughs> and we're sure taking care of now. No. What are they? Do we know? I hear Don Redwood on the left. How about Larch. the middle? Larch on the right. Bald cypress in the middle. There. Yeah, so we have, these are our three uh, deciduous conifers. They're conifers. They're an older family of trees, but that they lose their leaves in the fall and they put them back on as opposed to con um, Evergreen conifers, coniferous, mm. evergreen. Uh, real special trees. Don Redwood has become a, a prominent in the landscape. Uh, tech, uh, the uh, bald cypress doesn't um, isn't from here. It's not native. It is to the south, but they do really well. And they they are very tall in the uh, wet areas. The larch that does the best around here, as far as a landscape tree, would be the Japanese larch. Um, the American larch, uh, also called tamarack, uh, you find more in northern VA. There's some out in like a pine grove, uh, for instance, like that. Oh, 
But you can imagine the un unsuspecting tree cutter coming out and saying, well, your tree's dead, lady. Um, you need to cut it down. Um, and they've been cut down, right? Often it's the lark because they look the nastiest in there. Structural defects. Um, so trees growing in yards is not a uh, natural phenomenon. Trees evolved over millions of years to grow together in forests, and they grow, they grow straight, and they grow tall, and then you have understory trees that might um, be a you know, creek size or edge area. Uh, but when trees are open to sunlight on all sides, they're open to, they can just put out branches everywhere. And so sometimes they get a little out of balance. Sometimes they create structures where, where branches and stems are coming uh, too close together. And instead of having a strong attachment point, they are just pressing as they continue to grow and they put wood on either column both at each year. It just gets pressed and pressed and pressed. And at some point, that becomes a, uh, a weakened, compromised area and it's more likely to fall. Uh, trees with apical dominance, like on the right, uh, are designed to really uh, withstand wind and snow and are a much stronger um, configuration. So there's things that, when trees are younger, like deciduous landscape trees, it's important to prune them when they're young to create structure that makes them more sustainable when they're older. Uh, because here you can see, this is sort of that pressed, this was just pressed wood. It wasn't uh, they call it included bark. That would be a situation where you have included bark and the weight gets to be too strong and just pulled away. Here's a, a black locust and it looks like an oak over there. And uh, sometimes you can't quite tell uh, a tree has a codominant stem with uh, included bark. But one, one telltale is often you'll see this start to bulge out each year as if the wood is sort of overflowing. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, I've noticed, well, I know with the push to plant native. Yes. I've found that like, as they grow, they, they look like they're going to split. And they often do. Yeah. We haven't had a bad ice storm for a number of years, but when we do, there will be a lot of red buds that are there. Um, and that's where structure pruning, pruning and end weight reduction and considering um, how, how uh, that develops is, is so key because uh, red buds are, are, are known for bad attachment points. Uh, stem girdling roots uh, sort of uh, um, can be can be a natural occurrence, but most likely it has to do with our production of trees starting in the nursery. This grew up. This tree evidently grew in a pot. You can see sort of wrapping around and around. Uh, we put it in the landscape, and it just keeps wrapping around uh, until it just falls over or it dies. Um, this looks like a, uh, a, a EMT years ago. Might be like a paramedic uh, training book, like <laughs> armed with the chipper or something. Um, but tons of uh, roots, just circling roots, and uh, if they don't strangle the tree, uh, they will topple because they don't have the support to hold up. And this, you know, this was a tree that evidently grew uh, to some size, it's about 30, 40 years old, um, but it had a root that was wrapped around and uh, it just pops out of the ground. Sometimes Sometimes you'll see it, there's a tree in a field, and it looks like a pencil just snapped right at the base. You don't even have to grind this down, it's a little dirty. <laughs> cavities, obviously a uh, concern. Some of you are talking about cavities, uh, the Rebelli Park. And uh, this can be a concern. It's nice when they show us. There's a sycamore on the left. Uh, but trees can live with cavities for a long time, and so uh, there's definitely, definitely management options uh, around that. Um, sometimes trees can be hollow and we don't see it, so sometimes those cavities are nice. Uh, we as arborists have tools, you know, we can sound it. A hollow log is going to sound different than a solid log. Uh, and when we don't tell from that, here's Eric, we have the resistograph. This is a, uh, uh, a drill with a fine uh, bit that goes into the tree, and as it goes, it, it measures resistance, and it puts a there's sort of like a Richter scale. Um, as it encounters resistance, the needle uh, goes on this graph paper and it goes higher and higher. And so you can see that this is not this. Uh, but the correlation, as it went in, there was tension and resistance. And then it drops off as it went through the hollow part of the middle. And then, of course, it went back into that. So that's a tool that we can use to determine, uh, sort of get a better understanding of, uh, of, a, of a risk on a large tree. Um, Free stall injury. 
um, uh, pretty common in fast growing trees. Um, who's, who's seen this? Um, yeah. uh, we have a, a really cold night, and then the sun comes up in the morning, and the, the core of the heart of that wood is colder than the way the, the outer rings, uh, the sap wood, is heating up so that differential uh, causes a <clears throat> just pops. And uh, once it happens, uh, it's not going back. Uh, trees will uh, grow around it, but you will get decay as a result over time. And sometimes it will remain open, like on the cherry. Uh, and over time, that could be problematic. Um, this is a sheer crag. That tree's a mess all, all, all sorts of ways, but if you saw that, Obviously, that's a tree that has elevated risk of failure. It probably should have come down a while ago. Um, sap rot, I guess we get calls about this too. Something's killing my tree. Well, more likely, this was a dead branch on a live tree, and this is just fungus that's colonizing to eat the dead wood, the saprophyte. Uh, here's a sap, uh, another sap rotter. Um, something killed the cambium of that tree, the, the outer living part, and um, so that is just um, taking advantage of that dead wood. The wood's already dead. We're sort of running low on time. I want to make uh, time, so um, I'm going to cut it there, and I'm, but I will be hanging out. Um, I knew I had way too much to talk about. Uh, but I, I thank you, and I'll be around for questions later. All right, so yeah, we're on. Dr. Shaw, I'm trying to model to let me be here tonight and talk a little bit, uh, like John shared, about Trees, sometimes they do need to come down, and when they come down, what do you do with them? That's kind of what I'm going to share with you. Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and talk But what can I do with the wood once it's lying in my yard? Uh, but before I get into that, I kind of need to explain who we are, Charlie's Craft Shop and Sawmill. This is my wife here. Uh, we're a family of two to be four. So two, well, one little five-year-old and a little on the way. So that has a big impact um, with the sawmill stuff and how I do things with life and whatnot. Uh, we both went to Messiah. We didn't meet there, we met uh, before that, but we were both studying Messiah. And like Michelle mentioned, it kind of started out as like a nagging responsibility. Um, as I was a kid growing up, wanting to do kid things and like, go out and play on Saturday when my friends were doing whatever they were doing, uh, it seemed like I was often cutting firewood with my dad, which I now have grown to appreciate like very, very much um, because it's turned into this. So that's a little bit about who we are. Um, the other thing is we're always outside, my wife and I, our daughter. I actually spent more time inside making this PowerPoint than the <laughs> trophy I wanted to be outside doing anything other than sitting home. <laughs> But anyway, we're always outside, and I always want to encourage people to like, get outside and enjoy nature, enjoy trees, look at the hazard trees, look at things that are around you. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about edibles, if you were here, um, <coughs> nature, natural edibles, and like that's that's a really neat part of creation that we can, you know, we can be a part of and enjoy. Um, the other thing, and how I met Rochelle, is my wife and I are involved with a camp around here, and it's a wilderness camp for a week and we take youth all over wherever we decide to go with them and we try to show them like why we enjoy nature, why we enjoy trees, plants, whatever. Um, why we enjoy creation. So just you know pictures of us doing that. So that all goes into how I and how you could look at a tree once it's laying there because there's easy ways to look at stuff and there's more in-depth ways um, to look at how these balls and trees are. Uh, so what do we do at Shaw's Craft Shop and Sawmill? We sort of here on the right. Uh, it's hard to see that picture there, but that's just a bunch of cut off lumber, just a better representation of the sawmill. So the sawmill is probably the biggest part of what we do. Um, it, that kind of is the driver for doing all the fun stuff, which I'll talk about later. Not that sawing isn't fun. I love sawing logs. That is a lot of fun. Uh, one of my most favorite things to do, which I learned about at Messiah, was there's this log that you see in your yard. It's kind of a nuisance. A lot of people don't know what to do with them unless they get them chipped off, which is certainly an option. Um, but if you have a log in your yard, you don't know what to do with it. When you cut that thing open and you see what's on the inside, like you get ideas. At least I get ideas. And that's 
that's one thing I like sharing with people is looking at things differently because you can look at things, you look at a log as a bunch of firewood and maybe that's a little more than it is. And that's fine. I cut a lot of firewood also. But so sawmill, that's the biggest part of our you know our deal. Uh, we go to different shows and events. Our Kona Road is in Mechanicsburg. Uh, that's probably our biggest event of the year. Uh, we basically make a bunch of stuff for that event, and the thought is whatever doesn't leave at that event should sustain us for the rest, for the rest of the year. So if you want to see a lot of, you can't see in that picture everything, but if you want to see all of that neat stuff before it's gone, like that's a good place to go. Um, and there will be a link in a, one of the last slides, for like a Facebook page, and a way to contact us if you do want to see any of that or be a part of that. Uh, the other thing that we do as a sawmill craft shop is mentorship. There's, this is a picture of, this is actually I'm upgrading the sawmill tracks because I, anything that I do, I have to modify. That's just how I am. So I knew whatever I got, I wasn't gonna be happy with. But you kind of see a little bright spot there. That's an intern that I had. And I really enjoyed being able to teach him how to weld and work with wood and be at the sawmill and make things and do all sorts of stuff. So he got to learn a lot and I got um, to benefit from that by really talking through all the things I was doing and teaching him. Um, he was interested in kind of approach me and wanted to do, do that, which I thought was, I wasn't gonna turn away. It was, it was help that I very much could use. Um, the other thing is we do some community events. The boys and I are also part of like a ministry, TCC is the name of that, but for Charlotte Craft Shop, I used to do open shop nights, which was one night a week. The shop was open. I was doing a project, and there were a lot of people in our community that had expressed interest in, they wanted to learn how to do do things or learn skills, and so I'm like, well, I'll open the shop, and once a week, you can join us, and you'll learn something. I'm not sure what it will be, but <laughs> you are willing to venture out, you'll learn something. So that's a little bit about what we do. Uh, I have two types of sawmills. There's a, there's a lot of different types of sawmills and ways to process wood. Uh, this is kind of how I got started out because actually this isn't the first way. This is the first legitimate way that I sliced through a log. The first way I cut through a log was while I was at Messiah College. It wasn't the safest thing. I would actually... <laughs> So like, this is a hand cart or a bandwagon or however you want to say that. That was involved with a chainsaw, the first way that I cut a log. If someone had told me like saw mills existed and there's a better way to do it, I'm still not sure that I would have listened. <laughs> would have gone shop. But anyway, so this is an option for sawing through stuff. And if you're trying to get into slicing logs somewhat accurately and having lumber for a reasonable price. This is a great way to get started. It's a lot more work to do this than it is to have a bandsaw mill. There's a lot more waste with this. The saw, the chain is thicker than a bandsaw mill. There's a lot of pros and cons, just like risk assessing a tree um, in the way the pros and cons of every, every decision. But anyway, so that's an Alaskan mill, also known as a chainsaw mill. And you can see here, I have, there's my little setup, and there it is also, without me holding it. The first cut always needs to be on a flat substrate, so I'm using a ladder in this, <coughs> this particular log for the first cut. Once you get the first cut done, it just needs to be flat, so you could actually run it on top of the previous cut. So that's what I'm doing here, I ran it on top of the previous cut. Um, it's a neat, neat tool. You can just adjust it up or down to determine the thickness you want to cut the slabs. It's slow, it's stinky, it's messy, it's a lot of work, but you can get lumber from it, which if you have a log in your backyard and you want to try to tackle getting lumber from it, that's a great way to go about it. It's important to also know the location. So, Wood is heavy, especially when it's so long that it's just been cut down. It's still wet, still green. Logs lose weight as they dry, wood loses weight as it dries. So you don't want to be this guy with a minivan. I can't believe that's a real picture. <laughs> He's got a flag on the back, so that's, that's a 
you don't want to be that guy. So know your limitations before you get into this. Um, there's certainly tools. Yeah. How do you think you got it in there? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen worse pictures of logs and things they shouldn't have been in. I wonder if that made it happen. Anyway, know your limitations uh, will come in handy. It will keep you out of trouble, obviously. If you're dealing with a log like that size or that size and it rolls in a way you're not expecting, like that's not, you don't want to deal with that. So know your limitations before you start. and. With the chainsaw mill, there's obvious, obvious limitations. Um, if you're transporting logs, don't, don't underestimate the weight of the log. There are apps and charts out there where you can determine based off the species and the diameter and the length and all sorts of different characteristics of whatever you have, what the weight might be as a green tree, as a one that's just been cut down. So um, I use that a lot actually, so I don't overdo things. So I'm not the purple minivan. <clears throat> so the bandsaw mill, I think there's going to be a video that plays, but basically the bandsaw mill is this guy right here, and there's a wheel here, and there's a wheel here, and there's a band that goes around those two wheels, and it's powered by like an engine motor or something there. That band spins around and has teeth on it, and it cuts the log, and you either manually, this is a manual mill, so I just manually push this, some of them, have a different drive system, whether it be hydraulic or dump drive, chain drive, whatever. It, it moves down the log. I think we'll see a video. Maybe. Yeah, sped up video of that's basically what it does. You'll see it raise, go back and lower. And it raises, goes down, lowers, and makes the next cut. And you just keep doing that until you run out of clearance on the salt mill or you can flip the log or anything <coughs> like that. Um, and then you end up with bottles of lumber with an intern that is able to offload wood as you're cutting. You have a lot <laughs> more deep piles and a lot less junk to deal with later on. Uh, so, are any of you guys woodworkers in here? Does anyone, does anyone work with wood? One? A little, little wood? Carving. So that, okay, that's, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. So, as a you carve, what do you carve? A little uh, shimmel style version. Okay. So what do you see? Look at this picture, this log. What do you see? <laughs> Bigger than mushy. <laughs> yeah. more, more birds than more. <laughs> <laughs> she sees an ostrich. Awesome. <laughs> what about, you said you're a woodworker also? I did. I am playing around with them, carving and charcuterie boards. Okay. So there's all sorts of things you can do with wood. That, yeah, that you see a table. That's what I saw, and I thought this is that, so that log is 44 inches diameter on this end. Um, my chainsaw mill, which is in this picture with the saws there, I can cut 46 inches. That's the capacity of it, and this log was. I don't care to have to cut that wide again. It's, <laughs> The slabs, the wood that came from that, I cut them at three and a half inches thick. They're heavy, very heavy. Like I have a skid loader, I can move them around. It's a pain dealing with heavy wood. Know your limitations. Small stuff is great because you can pick it up, you can move it around, it doesn't hurt your back, it doesn't, it doesn't wear you down as easily. But when I saw that, that's what I thought. I thought I could get some nice tabletops out of this. Uh, I could cut the wood, I could get the log, cut the wood, dry it, and then do something with it. It's a lot of work. I also saw a lot of work. Um, so before I go into specifics of what you can do with it, I want to talk about ash a little bit because, uh, like John had mentioned, the emerald ash borer is around, but there's some trees that are doing well with treatments um, that they have, especially here around Wildwood. But a lot of ash is dying or has already died and it's standing. And some of it is a hazard, I think John would agree. There's, there's yeah. part. Ash right now is my favorite wood. And I say right now because it could always change. I could always find something else that I like better. I really like box elder. I don't get the opportunity to saw much of that. It's really pretty, it has red inside. Anyway, uh, so here, all of these pictures are ash, but you can see they're all very different. They were different trees, so that has something to do with it, but different stages in the, in the growth and stuff and 
I think even where it is, whether it's near maybe a water source or more wet and more dry ground, I think might change. If the John can back them up or maybe you can speak to that a little bit, but I think minerals in the ground might change it. Maybe that's just my theory. Uh, but there was this cutting board here is ash. This is also ash, very different. This kind of whitish yellow color is pretty typical, but you get some weird splotchy pieces. I really don't know how it all happens, but I think you know, when you open up some of God's creation, these logs, I think what's inside them is beautiful. So, uh, yeah, you have, they're very like light color, and then there's some darker colored stuff. I think I do have a cutting board that is similar to that one. Here, I don't know why the colors are the way they are, but every time I open it up, I think, man, I can, that can, that'll turn into something beautiful. So, ash is my favorite wood. Right now, there's other species. Uh, these are just some of my favorite species that I've dealt with um, kind of recently. Uh, we talked about hackberry last week a little bit. I think there's something edible in hackberry, right? Mm -hmm. it is. It's still there, <laughs> Yeah, so hackberry usually doesn't look like this when it's cut over. Usually it's more white. Uh, this is also a piece of hackberry, so if you want to come up and look later on, you can. This white's pretty typical. Sometimes they get darker spots in them. And sometimes what you see there in the upper left-hand corner is faulting. Um, which I can go into a little bit of detail, but I'm not going to get real far. Basically, it's fungus and the tree is, either if it's in the tree, the tree is likely dying or it has issues. You can also kind of, I'm going to say artificially spalt a log. Once it's on the ground, you can, there's certain methods you can do to make certain colors come out, and you see the black lines, that's the small thing, all the black lines on the relatively light wood. But this is also hackberry, that was a cutting board. Uh, from this same piece of wood, just different spot on the tree, there's black walnut, there's a bench from black walnut. Black walnut's really popular and kind of trendy right now. The trend may end, but it's, it's really a beautiful wood. As far as we go, the, the sawmill and stuff, I don't necessarily like long, straight, perfect walls because you get long, straight, perfect grain. I really like when there's goofy stuff like knots and bumps and I, I like bark inclusion, like John was talking about also. None of these have that, but sometimes when you get bark inclusion and you're making a tabletop, you don't know it until you open the tree sometimes. Sometimes you can see it, but that bark inclusion, as long as you can keep the piece together as it dries, can be a really neat feature uh, in the tabletop characteristic. Well, yeah, there's a bench. Uh, black is really nice to work with. There's some maple we talked about. Maple trees two weeks ago, and about half of them. And there's all sorts of things you can find when you open up a maple tree. There's ambrosia maple, but there's also, a, we talked about tapping the trees. Ambrosia maple, and what sometimes is called a tap hole maple, you get confused a lot. It's not the same thing. I couldn't find any good pictures of tap hole maple that are not ambrosia that I can show you because they get confused so often. Uh, John talked a little bit about pin oak, and this is a pretty non-typical looking piece, but this is spalting. All the, the black lines you see there, that's all spalting. Uh, here's a cutting board from that same, same tree, spalting pin oak. And again, here is a piece of ash. This was the butt cut end of that big log that was on the earlier slide. Um, whenever I see stuff like this, I usually, you know, I have ideas on what the grain will look like. You can kind of guess what the grain will look like, whether you're doing a cross cut like this or uh, milling it, sawing it straight through. So whenever I look at a log, like I said, I get ideas. I'm trying to think whether I want to make a, like a just a wood thing out of it or there's going to be a utilitarian object that you can use. Or do I have something else on my property that I want to mix with this wood and do like a mixed material project? Um, there's a lot of things that I, I work in construction also, so there's a lot of materials that I get that are unique um, from different projects I do, so I really like to incorporate those materials with, uh, with wood. Um, a lot of advantage of having a tree that you would have cut down in your yard and now you have wood in your yard, is there can be a story to it. There, there will be a picture later on of 
A lady had a tree, it fell down, it nearly missed her house, but she had bought the house, I think, from her father. He had since passed away, and she had this tree that fell, and she played around that tree and on that tree. It had a tree house built on it, because there were screws and stuff in the tree. But it had a tree house built on it that she played in, and she really wanted that tree to be a part of her house that she had bought from her father. And so I cut the tree, slapped it out, and built her like a breakfast bar, and that's now installed in her house. So she has a story that can go along with this tree. So the tree is no longer there, but she has a piece of it in her home. So there's certainly sentimental value to um, certain trees as well. Um, the other thing I look at once I cut stuff open is like I look at little designs that might be in in the in the log in the wood, and I try to design things to complement. I try to design so earrings. We'll talk about that a little bit later. They're like my paint swatches. They're little. They're nice to work with. I can make a lot of them, and they're fun because I can see a lot of different wood very quickly, and you can see a lot of different samples of different logs. But I try to make a composition. Like I said, I went to the side. She went to the side. We both were art students, so there's this whole thought about composition and where you place. She's wearing these there. So there's, there's certainly a, an aspect of composition, like where where do I put this, and that makes these look better or worse. She actually made these. I didn't make these. But I don't know. The only ones I made. They're the only ones she made, but I like them a lot. What else? Oh yeah. So what else? Uh, more cutting boards. Here's this uh, breakfast bar this lady wanted. Um, is, that's in Silver Spring area. So that was, it was a neat, that was a neat project that meant a lot to her. Anyway, so breakfast milk, cutting boards. This is a piece of black walnut. Um, pretty big cutting board. I enjoy making them. They're a lot of fun to make. Also, this is a bunk bed or a, like a loft bed. It's in my daughter's room now. That was made out of ash. An ash tree that was on our property. So again, certainly some sentimental value and some story there. Uh, so you can make all sorts of things. You can make lumber, you can make projects with it, you can make tables, you can make cutting boards. This was the top of a coffee table. On that, it's hard to see, but there's a bunch of earrings. In the middle of this, there's, I think there's bookmarks, right? So those bookmarks are recycled paper, handmade paper. Some of those have like little pieces of like sawdust chips in them, and that's what makes those pieces of paper interesting. Um, what else do we have? We have a bunch of wreaths. My wife makes wreaths. Uh, they are actually Rose of Sharon, so they're not necessarily a tree per se, but you can do all sorts of things with the wilderness that's around you. Even the branches are, if you have kids, grandkids, or a young mind, they're fun to play with. Uh, what else? We've got some picture frames here, and one or two up here on this table. These picture frames are made with, the, the frame of it is what is referred to as a sticker. Whenever you cut a log up and you have different slabs, it's important to dry them before you use them because wood moves as it dries, it gets lighter, the water that's in it leaves. As it leaves, it shrinks, it warps, it twists, it does all sorts of things. And how you dry them can help or not help uh, being able to have usable wood whenever you're all done drying. But stickers are basically a piece of wood that you stick at certain intervals in between pieces of lumber to help airflow get through and help it dry out evenly. There's a picture frame made with stickers. They have handmade paper in them. So it's just kind of using all parts of the tree to the best <coughs> that we can to steward in that. Um, so paint swatches. I kind of refer to the earrings and the cutting boards as paint swatches because you go to a, you're trying to paint a room, you go to the paint store, pick out some swatches, pick what you think you like, take it home, yeah, I like this, then you go get the bigger thing. I like these because these kind of are little samples, they help me visualize what a larger piece might look like. And I can dry thin wood out a lot faster than thicker wood. So if I have, like, take these earrings here, if I have that piece of wood, you can take it, you can dry it. You can put wood in the oven to dry it. That is pretty neat, actually, for small pieces of wood. 
And then you can work with it, you can finish it, see how it accepts finishes, and maybe you decide, I really don't like this wood once it's finished. I'm not gonna waste my time building a larger project with it. Or you really fall in love with it and you think, I need to invest time into letting larger pieces dry. So that's kind of why I do them as paint swatches. And I make dozens of these, and it's really exciting to see Usually I make about 60 at a time, 60 sets. So it's really exciting to see them go from kind of this like, everything's just kind of the dull color and then you put finish on and the colors all pop. That's a really exciting time. Um, sometimes we have people over to see that because it is, it's kind of like, oh, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah. So here's a bunch of cutting boards. I do a run of these. Making one cutting board is a lot more manageable time-wise, and if something goes wrong, it's a lot more manageable to deal with than making a lot of them. But if you're using the same tool over and over, sometimes it's more efficient to do it that way. Um, <coughs> the cutting boards and the earrings, you probably need the least amount of, you need the least amount of tools to do that work. If you have a jigsaw, you can make a jigsaw and a drill with a hole saw. You don't even need a hole saw, some of these don't have handles or like holes in them. If you have a jigsaw and some sandpaper, you can generally make a cutting board. It just is gonna take more time than if you had a lot of tools. So there's fairly low like, startup cost for trying to do that. You don't need many tools for cutting boards and you get a beautiful product in the end. Uh, same thing with the earrings. They're small enough and manageable enough that you don't need a lot of tools. You can use a utility knife to make a lot of these earrings. It just, you have to be careful with your fingers. <laughs> And here's more uh, cutting boards and earrings to the show. This was like the second week we did the Arcona show. The first week went well. I still had stuff left over. We wanted to go back because a lot of people were asking for us. So we went back. Yeah, again, you see cutting boards, paper, earrings, and there's some other stuff there. But in this picture, there's just for the species, there's black walnut, there's ash. This is a piece of red oak, and that's a piece of red oak, but this piece of red oak has faulting which is what you see the, the black lines are there. So every piece of wood, every species is going to look different depending on what piece of wood it is in the tree. Too. Uh, so, like I said, we have a sawmill. We cut a bunch of slabs. I have some of them kind of stocked that people can just come get a slab and do a project if you don't have a tree that you have in your yard that you need to take care of and you want to try your hand at woodworking. There are opportunities. And there's a lot of places that have it. Slabs, but customer projects, uh, and popular things to do with the trees, just to give you some ideas more so than the little stuff. If you want to try something larger, uh, like floating shelves is a pretty popular thing to do. This tabletop here is known as a river table. Basically, what you do is you would take a, a slab and you would cut it in half and you would reverse the two, so you have, like if my pinky were the bark edges, you put the bark edges in the middle and you fill the middle with resin or epoxy and that's the river, part of the table. Uh, that center is expensive, so if you're trying to cut down the cost, maybe a river table isn't the way you want to go. It's also very, you need to be very particular when working with that stuff there in the center. Uh, this is also a piece of ash. So I was really happy that that customer sent me a picture because I really like ash, if I didn't say that already. <laughs> One of my most interesting things that I've heard that people make, uh, turkey calls. I cut up two logs of pin oak. They were all spalting like this. They pretty much looked like that the entire way through. A guy contacted me about making turkey calls. So I said, okay, sure, come check out a piece of wood. Apparently he's known across the nation. He's like award-winning turkey call guy. He, I forget his name. I was really, it was like years ago. I was trying to find his name. So he bought two logs that were already cut up. I don't know how many turkey calls he makes a year. He must make a lot. But he bought two entire logs, both about 18 inch diameter and six to eight foot long. I'm guessing he made turkey calls from all of them because that's what he does. <laughs> Another, another idea, this is locust, and a lot of times locusts will have kind of voids in it, and really any tree that has voids in it. Epoxy is a popular thing to put in inside the voids to, you know, you get 
a solid surface then, not a surface that has all sorts of dips in, and it adds a lot of interest. Um, this, this guy, he's from Maryland, he does custom kitchens for people. So he, he's come back a couple times and got different stuff. He always picks out. He has a great eye for looking at a wall that looks like it's trash. And he'll pick that wall and turn it into a table like that. Or this is actually a full dining set. And then he had, he made cabinets from, I think they were hickory. They were also beautiful. So you do all sorts of things. So what I also see looking at trees or logs, or you have this thing that's in your garden that you might think is a nuisance. And the only reason I say it's a nuisance is that's how I get most of my wood is people have a log in their yard and they don't know what to do with it. And they're tired of trying to find something to do with it. If they can't handle it themselves, that's where I usually come in. Um, I encourage people to do things with the wood because there is so many cool things you can do with it. And if nothing else, people always want firewood. If you can't figure out how to get rid of a log, firewood is a great opportunity. Just someone will come get it for firewood. Anyway, I also see a lot of other opportunities when I see a log in someone's yard or in my yard and I have a, a log that's cut open and it's, I see the grain on it. I know that that's not just one moment, one opportunity for me to deal with now. There's a lot of teaching moments with it, a lot of opportunities to, again, going outside, to get outside and do things with it. So there's all sorts of opportunities. Like I said, me and my wife being involved in wilderness type things, um, a tree, if you have kids or grandkids or anything like that, they can have so much fun playing with the pieces of a tree, like the sticks and the branches and even the bark. There, there will be a picture at some point of my daughter playing with a piece of bark, which most of us would just discard and you know, throw away if she found enjoyment with it. Uh, so up here in the left hand corner, that's a bracelet that is made from cordage. And there's a couple of different trees that you can make cordage from, and it's kind of something that's fun to do if you have idle time and you have bark laying around. This is from, I think it's a Chinese chestnut, I think that's what the tree was. But basically from the inner layer of the bark, and this got dried up laying here, but if you were to soak it, you can peel some of it off. Uh, cedar is, red cedar is really good for doing this. That's what this bracelet is made out of. And when it's new, and you just make the cordage really, really strong uh, for what it is. But yeah, you can pull pieces off and there's a technique you can use that you twist it and you can make cordage out of it. So that's a wilderness skill that we like to teach people. It's also just kind of fun. Um, if you, you know, if you're always doing something with your hands, like earlier I was sitting here trying to because I, that's just the way I am. So the cordage uh, bow drill, depending on what the species is, you can do all sorts of wilderness skills with it and learn them, they're a lot of fun. Bow drill is one of my favorite because just like finishing wood, when people see the finish go on wood, same thing with bow drill. When you're using, when you use like pieces of a tree to make fire, like people are like, wow, like that's it's really, really a lot of fun. There are also teaching opportunities. John talked about that a little bit, um, about the daycare and the tree that was there. Uh, it's a teaching opportunity for all the kids that go to that daycare to see you know, a tree and what it's doing. Uh, and also processing wood is best done, I think, with other people. So there's my daughter a couple years ago and a skid loader. She's not running it, obviously, but <laughs> she is always under my feet at the sawmill, which is great. I love them. That she's there and wants to be involved in learning the thing. She's actually, she's five now, she's actually helping. Like, you know, kids go from a, they're just kind of there to a helping, and she's helping, it's really, really awesome. Uh, other things you can do with your logs, if they're smaller diameter, they can be bigger diameter too, but of course. Um, there's, you can do some landscaping, I made some stairs a while ago. There's a basket woven out of, I don't even know what the tree was, but there's a tree that came down. I cut some of it up and some of it turned into a bow drill, some of it turned into a basket. I don't know what I did with the rest of it, I might have burned it. But speaking of burning things, if you don't have wood to burn, you don't get to have experiences like this. So this guy here is no longer around, but he, we were, we were uh, butchering hogs that day and he was able to pass on some of his knowledge to us uh, making scrap on if we didn't have wood. 
to burn a fire, to make scrapple. Like, I would have never been able to learn that. And that's, that's a skill that he was able to pass down multiple generations. And a lot of you can see other people there that were all learning that same thing. Without wood, they were burned that had been prepared beforehand. They wouldn't have been able to experience that because you can't burn wood very well. Chickens. When you cut wood, you have sawdust, you have bark, there's all sorts of extra things you have you don't know what to do with. Chickens love sawdust, so we have some chickens. They always get our sawdust, and that's what you know we kind of throw in, so whatever they lay eggs. Obviously, I like being outside and outdoors. Camping is a, a big deal for for us. Again, firewood, and last picture there is a bunch of um, oh, a lamp is tree, tree heavens. Uh, a lot of that, that guy was just going to cut down firewood. I don't know if you can see it real close, but a lot of his trees were like that. They were they had two or three inches of solid wood, and the inside was just gone. Um, yeah. That was a, that was a fun. One time. So I always have helpers. There you see my wife. Uh, we moved the mill and she was cutting out a few pieces. So it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, you can help. There's a way that you can help and process wood. You just need to know your limitations. Yeah, there's my daughter sweeping, which honestly is a huge help because if I'm not keeping a workspace clean, you're tripping over it, you're dropping stuff, it, it just turns into a mess. So if you start to process wood and make earrings or cutting boards or tables or anything to do with what are carving, you have a lot of shavings all over the place. And eventually, those shavings just become, you need to stop every now and then and clean up. At least that's what I've experienced, I'm sure others would agree. Um, so it's always good to you know, have help cleaning up. Uh, she mentioned carving. Another thing you can do with wood is turning. Um, and turning is where you have a lathe and you stick a piece of wood in the lathe and the wood spins very fast and you take a tool and as it's spinning you introduce the tool to the wood and start to remove pieces of the wood and like this would be a pen blank. Like someone can make a pen out of this piece of wood. So I do cut stuff for that. I don't personally turn. There's enough things that I do that I wouldn't be able to dedicate enough time to learn this skill to do it well. So I cut blanks for people and I let them turn. But I like to see what other people can do with the wood also. Because not everybody can do everything. So yes, yeah, so this spin, you introduce a tool to it and it takes material away. And what you're left with is what the turn off it is. Oh, yeah, so leftovers, sawdust, bark, piles of little branches, what do you do with them? We're going to talk a little bit about the burn it, campfires, again, outside camping. Uh, here's my daughter with this piece of bark that she found on the wall. <coughs> she finds the oddest things and plays with them, which I think is great because there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of that today with young children, a lot of times people don't necessarily see the value in in the everyday things that you pass by and that's that's my main my main love with this is seeing the value in these everyday things that we pass by um, being able to show that and share that with people also uh, so yeah leftovers you got bark let your kid play with it eventually you can burn it or it does good for compost so we have a garden i guess you can see some of these garden beds are made from different pieces of wood there's a lot of things that are made with wood. If you have a tree, you have an endless, not, not an endless, you have a good supply of something. You just have to figure out what that something is and what the potential is. But sawdust and bark does well in um, compost bins, mixed with other things, not just by themselves. But if you have a garden, that's something interesting to, to think about. What, and types of sawdust matter also, depending on what you're trying to grow, because not all sawdust has the same levels of chemical water, not chemical nutrients and stuff in it, acidity and base. So if anyone has any questions, I want to take questions. Before we go to questions, uh, this log here is at base 40, and yeah, this ash piece here is uh, that log we saw earlier in the slideshow that I saw like tables from. You can see there's one nice table, there could be another nice table. Now what you don't see is this little bit of dark spot in the center here. 
that's all rotten. Pretty much the rest of the way through that tree is rotten. Um, it was a large ash tree, so I'm glad that I got a couple of nice slabs out of it. What I did get out of it that I didn't want to give other people and turn it into a picnic table, so now we have a pretty neat and unique picnic table um, at our house. So there's always things you can do with it.